Okay, Tommy Cacalorla, Dolorig. Um, today we will discuss with the representative from Boards West Ireland the issue of what is happening to the board population in Ireland and obviously related matters. Um, and I will welcome Una Duggan, the Assistant Head of Policy and Advocacy, Brian Caffrey, Assistant Head of Surveys and Monitoring, and Dr Anita Donaghy, uh, Assistant Head of Species and Land Management. And before I ask us to address the meeting, I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. I also wish to advise you that the opening statement and other documents you have submitted to the committee may be published on the committee website after this meeting. Members are also reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Um, so an issue with two succor lesson crinu. Uh, and core also are do spare uh ta the uh frivolate the gum uh ear our Una Duggan uh Coral Lahara Yanov. Um I invite Una to start her presentation. Coral Margaret. Gurmina Margaret the Cor Cam Corla um and members, well, thank you very much um, for inviting us here today to talk about how Ireland's birds are faring. The primary objective of Birdwatch Ireland is the conservation of wild birds, their habitats and other biodiversity. Our organisation is the largest independent nature conservation charity in Ireland with 15,000 members, a network of 25 branches nationwide and over 1,500 volunteer surveyors who contribute thousands of hours of survey time collecting information on our wild birds. We are a science-based organisation and our staff includes internationally recognised experts. We are the Irish representative of <coughs> BirdLife International, the world's largest conservation partnership, and we collaborate with a wide range of stakeholders to achieve our goals. Today we will outline the conservation status of Ireland's wild birds, the pressures and threats they are facing, what we are doing to help and what else needs to be done. The Dáil declared a biodiversity and climate emergency on May 9, 2019 and also called for biodiversity loss to be addressed by the Citizens' Assembly. This indicates that as a nation we recognise that our wildlife is in trouble and that urgent action is needed to protect and safeguard our environment into the future. This year is Birdwatch Ireland's 50th anniversary. In the last 50 years we have seen, Ireland has seen dramatic changes to its landscape and to its biodiversity. Birds are key indicators of the health of our environment and they face many challenges. Significant changes are evident in bird populations, most sadly for the worse. There are some good news stories, but the trends for some key species groups are very worrying. With our mild climate and vast abundance of wetlands, Ireland attracts thousands of migrant water birds every year. For the past 25 years, we have monitored their populations through the Irish Wetland Bird Survey, funded by the National Parks and Wildlife Service and coordinated by Birdwatch Ireland with the help of our volunteer network. Each year, roughly 11,000 volunteer hours are contributed to the survey by irreplaceable, skilled individuals who care about and want to protect their local birds and wetlands. Our most recent iWeb's survey analyses shows that Ireland has lost around half a million water birds, almost 40% in less than 20 years. In more specific detail, the analysis shows that over half of the 15 wader species that regularly winter here have declined. For example, our wintering lapwing are down by 67% in less than 20 years. Mallard, a duck so familiar to everybody that it is often overlooked, has declined by over 40% in the last 20 years. Habitat loss, climate change and cumulative impacts represent the biggest pressures and threats on our wintering water, water birds and urgent action is needed to protect areas important for them and to maintain the diversity of species. 
Farmland in Ireland has changed significantly in the last 50 years. The Countryside Bird Survey, a Birdwatch Ireland uh, led citizen science based survey funded by the National Parks and Wildlife Service has been running since the late 1990s and monitors the most common breeding birds in the Irish landscape. Results tell us that although many common species such as goldfinch and blackcap are stable or increasing, about a quarter of familiar farmland birds such as stock dove, swift, green finch, stone chat and kestrel are exhibiting serious declines. More detailed knowledge of longer term trends in all bird populations comes from another volunteer based survey, the Bird Atlas, the most recent of which was completed in 2011. Bird atlases allow us to monitor change over the longer term and are particularly important to highlight declines indicative of dramatic changes in the Irish landscape. The atlas shows that our once biodiversity rich farmland landscape has become less and less hospitable for wildlife as agricultural methods and technologies have intensified. This is clearly reflected in the most complete, in the almost complete extermination of farmland birds such as the corn crake. Once widespread, they are now confined to the most marginal areas of the west and northwest as lake cut hay meadows have been converted to multiple cut silage. Similarly, severe declines have been recorded in most of our breeding waders, including curlew, lapwing and snipe. These species, once widespread and familiar to many farmers as they nest in damp pastures, traditional hay meadows and bogs, are disappearing. Curlew is one of the most severely impacted and is now on the verge of extinction in Ireland with only 150 pairs remaining of the 5,000 pairs that nested here in the 60s and 70s. Once, not long ago, the famed cry of the curlew was literally the sound of wild Ireland, but most of its former strongholds have now fallen silent. The main reasons for the declines of many farmland birds is again habitat loss but from the widespread drainage of wetlands, damp pastures and the more intensive management of agricultural grasslands through reseeding and increased fertiliser use. Other factors include industrial scale, extraction of peat bogs and afforestation of habitats. Remaining populations of many farmland species, especially ground nesting birds, are now more fragmented and isolated and are impacted by predation. Loss of mixed and arable farming has also impacted species such as the yellowhammer and skylark. And this also resulted in the extinction of the corn bunting in Ireland in 1991. While agri-environment schemes such as GLOSS, where farmers are incentivized to work the land in an environmentally friendly way, have gone some way towards maintaining or in some cases improving bird habitat on farmland, such schemes do not go far enough. Other activities, including inappropriate hedge cutting and the burning of scrub and upland habitats, are detrimental to our native wildlife and impact our carbon stores. The changes to the Wildlife Act contained in the Heritage Act passed last year have sadly weakened the protections afforded to breeding birds of uplands and hedgerows and must be repealed. Water quality in lakes and rivers affected by nutrient runoff and other inputs can reduce the number of invertebrates, which in turn has a knock-on effect on birds living in these aquatic habitats such as dipper, kingfisher and grey wagtail. Raptors are apex predators sitting at the top of the food chain and hence they can be affected by a range of changes and pressures in the environment. There have been several positive conservation success stories such as the return through reintroduction of species such as white-tailed eagle and red kite and buzzard and peregrine falcon populations are recovering in the Irish landscape after almost disappearing. However, many of the issues which have caused the declines and extinctions of birds of prey are unfortunately still present in the Irish countryside. The illegal killing of birds of prey remains prevalent and affects a wide range of species through shooting and indiscriminate poisoning. To tackle these wildlife crimes, there is a need for greater emphasis on investigation and enforcement of the legislation, including better resourcing of the National Parks and Wildlife Service and greater co collaboration with Angarda Siakana. Raptors can also be exposed to other poisons which are legally used, such as rodenticides, which are targeted at controlling rats and mice. Barn owl is a red-listed species of conservation concern in Ireland and its populations have declined dramatically, largely due to land use changes and the intensification of agriculture, which has caused a reduction in the extent and quality of habitats available to it. Hen harrier populations have also declined for similar reasons. Much of their upland nesting habitat has been lost to the planting of non-native conifer plantations. There are many species of birds that coexist with humans 
um, living amongst us in our cities, towns and villages. We often refer to this suite of birds as urban birds. Swift populations have undergone 50% decline in the last 20 years. Factors including the loss of nest sites in the fabric of our older buildings where access to the roof space and gaps in masonry has housed their nests for generations is one of the issues. Old buildings being demolished, renovated and retrof retrofitted displace nesting swifts by removing this vital access that they once had. Once a swift loses its nest site, it can mean many lost breeding seasons before the monogamous pair finds new suitable nest sites and can breed again. Other impacts include climate change and in particular the decline in insects, insects which the swift slowly relies on for food. A familiar other visitor to Dublin is from Arctic Canada, which is the Brent Goose. Ireland hosts a high percentage of the global population of this species. They are threatened by the squeeze for space, which is far greater in our capital than anywhere else in the country due to the pressure for development. Brent geese need permanent short grassland swards, such as of playing pitches, to graze in the lean months of the winter, sites of which are disappearing in our capital. Ireland supports internationally or even globally important populations of a number of seabirds. Puffins and kittiwakes are globally threatened and declining and have declining populations in Ireland, while black-headed black gull and herring gull are on the Irish red list due to dramatic decline in breeding numbers in recent decades. Climate change is probably the most serious threat to seabirds as the oceans warm, their food sources are changing. Other serious threats include sea level rise, oil pollution and increasing abundance of ingested plastics in seabird diets, as well as fatal entanglement in discarded fishing gear and non-sustainable fisheries practices. Birdwatch Ireland staff have been involved in several active conservation projects for terns, including conservation of roseate terns on Rockabill Island off Skerries. This has been a profoundly successful project and shows what can be achieved with the input of resources. In the last 30 years, num numbers of roseate terns have increased from 152 breeding pairs to 1,597 breeding pairs. So what is being done to address declines of bird populations? Birdwatch Island uses many tools to, for further, uh, to further conservation efforts, including large-scale EU-funded conservation projects. Nationally funded work includes long-term management, protection, research and monitoring of several important species groups. Our advocacy and awareness raising work seeks to influence decision makers to improve policies which impact on bird populations and to engage with the public on the issues facing birds and their habitats. There are other actions happening all around the country supported by government and concerned members of communities which is heartening. Indeed, it is clear that Irish people care deeply about their natural heritage, as witnessed by the green wave which has taken hold in recent times. However, we will need to take further significant action if we are to protect bird life and nature on our island. Ireland is in the midst of a biodiversity crisis. Saving biodiversity in Ireland is the responsibility of all government departments and sectors, and all stakeholders have a part to play to turn the ship around. Government must ensure that sectoral policies are, are coherent with the policies and legal obligations to protect and conserve biodiversity. Tackling the chronic, historic funding cuts for biodiversity is essential. Now is the time to bolster this funding to ensure that we can continue to avail of the ecosystem services that nature provides. Full implementation of the National Biodiversity Action Plan is a must before it expires in 2021. In addition, we must act to stem the worst impacts of climate breakdown, including using nature-based solutions for climate action. The farmed landscape supports some of our most threatened and declining species. One of our most important messages to the committee is that government policy must urgently recognise and reward sustainable and low-intensity farming systems that are supporting birds and other biodiversity. The policy direction of Foodwise 2025 is contrary to this in practice, and this does not bode well for biodiversity, climate or for farmers on marginal land. Ireland's climate ambition relies heavily on forestry, but forestry policy to date represents a significant pressure and threat to biodiversity with insufficient safeguards for high nature value farmland, ground nesting birds and other wildlife. In relation to our vast marine area, Ireland needs to fully implement the Common Fisheries Policy and the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. We cannot protect what we don't measure. Funding is needed for additional bird survey 
coverage to fill gaps in our knowledge of bird species distributions and abundances. This will require professional coordination and survey with support from citizen scientists. In conclusion, Kilmcorla, again, birds are the indicators of the health of the environment. Conservation of wild birds and their habitats will bring wider benefits to biodiversity, communities and our economy. But there is a huge challenge ahead and that can only be met by political will. Policies that work with nature instead of against them and a significant increase in funding to save our birds and biodiversity. Website that I can push this up. Kind of the, the, the longer version of what you've just read out there kind of will be available on the uh, committee's uh, website. Very, very informative um, and a lot of interesting facts there, which I hope kind of go beyond this room, which is the key idea. So, um, either of the senators want to say anything? Well, thank you very much, Chair, and, and thank you uh, for coming in, uh, Dr. Duggan, and your colleagues. And I don't know whether I'm happy or depressed uh, listening to what you've just said. Um, can, you, can you tell me, um, first of all, I just want to ask a few questions, and anybody answer them. There might be semi answered here, but you might be more, a little bit more specific, because I know you have to run through kind of something for, for seven or eight minutes, and it doesn't allow you to stop and really go into it. Who's really listening to you? Who is it? That's the first question. So, and is there so, anybody? Who are the people? Is on. It's not mine. It's not mine. <laughs> um, uh, who is really listening to you? Is there anybody listening? Who is seriously listening to you? Now, I know you're seriously listening to yourselves because without all those volunteers and all those people and all those ornithologists and all those bird people involved in your organisations, um, you wouldn't even be out the door. Um, but who's really listening? And how do you feel the government's announcement of the natural environment emergency, which is a major big announcement, um, will really help you? What's the practicality of that? And have you seen since that announcement, or has there been promises, and what are those? Because it's one thing to announce an emergency, it's another thing to actually, I, that's not me, but I'll put it there, uh, um, another thing to actually announce pillars of what you're actually going to do about that, and how you're going to tackle the, the, the different aspects of that. Um, uh, do you think, and this is a, a, a bugbear of mine, and the Chair would know this, that there is a case now, and you should be making it along with all our other natural environment, for a natural environment department. Department of Natural Environment. In other words, that you're not sharing the stage with heritage, well, with culture or with language. I'm not suggesting they're not extremely important, but I just think that we have come to the stage that the natural environment, a Department of Natural Environment, is is as important as a Department of Finance, and it because it's got so many leaves of our lives in it. And so, what do you think about that? Um, yes, that's another question. The other, next one is, I, there seems to be a lot of advice to farmers. Uh, where is there a lot of advice to industry? And um, is that paying any attention? And to building? I know there's intensif intensification of farming, and there's a lot of that, but the intensification of building for our seabirds and that. But uh, is there a lot of advice there? Or do companies, is, are, is, is that a huge communication for you? Or are you involved in that communication? The other thing is, um, I, I, there was one sentence here that is an example of something I just would like you to explain. I'm, I'm very sorry, I just can't find it. It is a very good piece. Um, one of my fav most favourite birds in the whole world is the swift, because it's su such a genius. It's such a genius. I, I think education plays a huge part in this with young people. I think they have more sense of what's in the air than, than we possibly had. Y you have written something like this. The most important action which could be taken by government is to ensure that sectoral policies are coherent with the policies and legal objectives to protect and conserve biodiversity, including our wild birds and our habitats. I just think that is so convoluted. So what, what do you actually mean by that? And um, so that's about all, and to thank you very much. Um, 
but we should have more. We need to hear more from you at this level all the time. You know, you need, all people run in and out of here from finance, and they run in and out of here from insurance and from education and from needs, but they, we need to hear from you far more, you know, at committees that you need to demand that you that, that you're here just as much as the other groups who seem to be in all the different committees, because everything you're saying has a part to play in every committee, not just this committee, but education committee, um, not just the education committee, but agricultural committee, you know, and that you, you have so much to say, because one of the most important things you've said, the birds will tell us how healthy our environment is. I mean, it's all in that sentence. Uh, so I would want to see you more and that maybe you could make, you could think about ways to do that, that you are as important to speak to every committee, including finance, including all these committees where everybody runs health every, in, into them, that you have as much a right to be there and as great a part to play. Um, but I would see you as having an independent, the chair would know that I have, a, but have to change the constitution, but not really, that would be easily done for, especially in this climate, we need a natural, a department of natural environment. So maybe you just talk to me, anybody around those might set you off crazy, but maybe answer maybe some of those questions. Okay. Or their discussions really, as opposed to questions. Um, thank you, Senator. Um, just to um, go back to your first part of your question in relation to who is listening, um, I think the people are listening. Um, I think um, if you look at um, our members, our branches, but the wider community as well, people are listening, they are seeing what's happening to the natural environment and they are concerned. Um, so. If you recall, the Heritage Bill was a campaign that we worked on for a couple of years and 35,000 people signed a petition saying no to that piece of legislation. Um, so the people are, like this was before the green wave started, let's say, and to me that was an indication that there was a, a, a wave of people out there that really are concerned about the environment. They're tapping into the likes of Birdwatch Ireland and seeing what we're doing and other environmental NGOs as well. Um, but. They are, they are the ones that are really listening, I think. But more and more, um, I think that information is being fed up to, through the political system and that politicians are hearing it more on their doorsteps, that nature is important to the, to the people. Um, so um, we've seen that then with the, 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 the declaration of the, the climate emergency um, in, in the Dáil on May 9th. And while, you know, it could be seen as, by some, as, oh, okay, you know, it's easy to just say this and what happens next. Um, I think it is an important acknowledgement of, of where we are and there's something for us then to build on and to um, keep bringing back to, to the committees like this and to with our other representations. Um, but one thing I was very disappointed that, like, uh, there was a climate, uh, there was a, part of the declaration of the emergency was also the call for the Citizens' Assembly to address the issue of biodiversity loss. Um, and that wasn't taken up in the rounds of Citizens' Assemblies that was announced by government there about two weeks ago. So. That was disappointing, to say the least, and we've written to the Taoiseach and we've written to, um, to others to say, okay, you've, you've said this in the doll that this is going to happen and you know, it's not on the list, when is this going to happen? <coughs> so we would really hope to see that happen because it is very important to channel this insight and this care of so many people in Ireland for their natural environment up into a conversation that would um, put some structure um, to how government responds, because it, you know, you've said that yes, Birdwatch Ireland, you need to be at these committees, and yes, you're right, you're absolutely right. We should, we will be hopefully um, speaking at at more committees, but it's, it it has to seep into the conversation of everybody that 
um, and that convoluted sentence you're talking about in relation to coherence, policy coherence, well, that would mean like that we could convey that when you're doing new buildings that you would have swift blocks. We'd already think, wait a second, birds, birds use buildings. How do we get, how do we get swift bricks into new buildings? Um, so that you're thinking of this, what impact is going to have if we plan that building right beside the, the special protection area for birds? Maybe that wouldn't be a great idea. So it's this, uh, you know, it's a thinking process before the planning process, for instance, to, to think about is this, is this a good idea? So, and then it could be expanded further into agriculture and other areas. But so just back to that, yeah, there are people listening. The, the government is also listening, starting to listen. And um, there's been significant, I suppose, um, efforts um, to, to help with biodiversity loss, but just not enough. And the, the problem is you have sometimes the left hand is doing one thing and the right hand doesn't know what's going on. And uh, there's a policy incoherence there. Chair, just, just to the chair, and I, what did you think of the idea of, of a Department of Natural Environment? Yeah, perhaps um, I could answer that. Um, uh, it's just I think it's something that would be very, very important to try mm. and move forward, and uh, it would give recognition to I think the feeling and the um, the recognition that uh, Ireland and its nation cares about the environment in and. Um, we need to really step up our efforts mm. if we're going to be, if we're serious about protecting biodiversity, what we have left, then we need to um, give much more weight and mm. emphasis to the actions that need to be undertaken, the knowledge that needs to be spread, and um, only by creating mm. a department dedicated to mm. the um, protection of the environment, I think we'll, we'll that department have the status that it needs. At the moment, the National Parks and Wildlife Service, yes, they do an excellent job, but they're mm. a very small, tiny department, mm -hmm. you know, within a much larger one, and they don't have a voice. And um, I think it's very important that they are given, um, and the natural environment is given a much greater voice within um, within the government of this country. Mm. And at the moment, um, I think, really, for some species, we are talking about very stark choices, particularly in relation to agriculture, you know, and intensive agriculture. Mm. And we can't have intensive agriculture and retain some of these farmland species that are important to things like curlew and lapwing, mm. corn creek, etc. You can't have both always, mm. you know. And um, there needs to be much greater recognition that if we value these species, mm -hmm. as much, obviously, of course, we value farmers and, and everything that they do and the importance of that industry. But equally, the um, the farmland birds and the biodiversity associated with farmland is fast disappearing. And to tackle that, you need a department which is much stronger and which has, mm. is able to engage at a much higher level with the Department of Agriculture. So I, I think it would be a very beneficial um, and important step for this government to take to, to introduce such a department. Very real. Um, thank you, and thanks for the presentation. Apologies, I just have to pop out to the Seanad for a few minutes. Um, just a number of questions, um, um, specifically in relation to the GLOSS scheme. Um, I suppose you've mentioned that further measures need to be taken to sort of have a robust GLOSS that values um, biodiversity. Um, in the context of the next um, CAP um, negotiations, what what exactly additional measures should be put in place, in your opinion, um, with regard to GLOSS? Um, secondly, just in relation to forestry, um, I live in the West, so I'm quite familiar with, um, I suppose, the challenge of um, non-native Cictus spruce um, in the West and in the Northwest. What has been, and you're obviously saying that that's having an impact in terms of biodiversity, what, in your opinion, um, is necessary in order to um, have a better forestry policy? I know they're talking about more diversification in terms of types of trees, but I suppose my question really is, is what, what input do you have into forestry policy? I'm thinking in particular there's a review um, in County Leitrim at the moment in relation to the forestry policy there. What, what is your input within the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine, um, who are obviously involved in instigating that review because of huge concerns from farmers um, 
on biodiversity, but obviously related to other issues as well. So those two specific questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll maybe just start off by um, answering or attempting to answer some of the, the first question about um, what else could be done in the next cap in relation <coughs> to protecting the environment. I think there's a, a few key things that we would like to, to see. Um, one of the most important things, I think, is um, advice to farmers, specialist advice to farmers who are implementing measures for farmland birds and other biodiversity. Um, there are some good options in Gloss, but um, there isn't nearly enough guidance um, to farmers as to how to... Um, farmland birds have specialised sometimes quite complex uh, requirements and uh, it's we've from testing of various schemes that we've done we've seen that the provision of special advice to farmers can greatly increase the um, the results from these schemes like in terms of biodiversity and the biodiversity return that you get is far higher where the farmer has access to specialist ecological advice so I think that's certainly one thing um, another thing would be um, longer term management agreements at the moment now this could be difficult to implement in, in terms of the cap cycles that are uh, we're dealing with at the moment but at the moment most agri-environment schemes are five years in duration and if you compare that for example with forestry um, the forestry scheme where the returns on investment are far longer term obviously that's an option that farmers are sometimes opting for because of the longer term security compared with um, for example glass which is a much shorter return so we would like to see a much greater and uh, you know very often to implement change at the farm level and change which is really going to have a positive impact on biodiversity you need to have agreements which are much longer in term because it, it can take it can take several it can take many <laughs> years to reverse some of the uh, damage that has been done as a result of intensification of agriculture for example so i think longer term agreements and landscape scale agreements, cooperative payments with farmers where they're working together to deliver biodiversity at the landscape scale would, would also be very important. Um, but also, um, I think you know the new eco-scheme that's being uh, talked about as part of the next uh, um, uh, CAP agreement, you know, the, the, um, so some actions need to be undertaken by all farmers, you know, some actions that will um, you know, reduce uh, levels of input, for example, of nutrient level, nu the reduced nutrient levels, and um, it can't just the burden can't just fall to a small number of farmers to implement those actions. You know, everybody has to. All farmers, even the most intensive ones, you know, have contributions that they can make and should be made to make in order to get this. What is essentially public money? Um, and in relation to forestry, um, I know Ian probably will say something, but um, we have engaged through the Curlew Task Force with the Department of Agriculture um, Forestry Division over um, guidelines for um, assessing applications for forestry, and there has been some good work done, and you know, the Department um, Forestry uh, Division have introduced new guidelines to protect curlew sites, but that's you know that's the only thing at the moment and obviously we would want to see a much greater and wider application of um of measures to protect birds from from afforestation i don't know if you want to add anything you know yeah um just in relation to the forestry um so we've actually uh, done a report called greening irish forestry and we met with the irish forest service there a few weeks ago to discuss some elements of that report with them um, but some of the things that are in it that we'd like to see um, see happen are like that there would be better ecological assessment of forestry plantations when they're going in on farmland that's not in a natura site in a special protection area special area conservation so that would identify like you do a survey and identify is this a species rich grassland that's important that needs to be saved is there are there ground nesting birds here other than curlew for instance um and so then you'd get a good baseline and then you know you can make a decision on whether this is worth putting trees on it or not because we are losing semi-natural grasslands um, in this manner um, that are high nature value and I know Chagas has re recently published a high nature value uh, farmland map and I think that'll that that's more finer uh, resolution so we'll be able to see where where they're documenting these sites um, but in addition currently the I know that um, there is a push for increase in more broad leaves within the um, forest stock and what's planted but 
it's predominantly still non-native Sitka spruce type of forestry that is um, uh, just n not great uh, in for, in many re respects, but we would like to see more, a lot more native woodland in the right places. So more trees, the right trees in the right places with the right management. So and, and continuous cover um, forestry as well, and not forestry that's just going to be clear felled. And I think there probably be a lot more community maybe buy-in as well with um, that type of forestry. Um, and and again even. Um, community-led woodlands as well I think would be a, a really good idea um, so Justin you were asking about the Leitrim report the review so yes we were interviewed as part of that um, so Bird of Ireland was where we await the outcome of, of that report and but it was just for Leitrim um, and now I know there was a midterm review of forestry supposed to be undertaken um, that would include ecological aspects as well, but I don't know what's happened with that. So we have um, that the forestry programs now, you know, will be, I think it's up until 2020. So we hope to be fully involved in, you know, contributing to the next policy. Okay, go Margaret. Follow up. Very brief. Um, just, just one question in relation to the specialist advice to farmers. Um, who would be best placed to give that? Um, second point is, um, I think you're right. Obviously, we know at the moment in terms of the GLOSS scheme, it's at full capacity. There are 50,000 farmers signed up to it, and it's obviously important that all farmers engage so I think that's a well made point. Um, just in terms of the curlew sites, um, have you seen progress? Because um, obviously it's um, a species that's hugely endangered. Is there progress have you seen progress in terms of those specific um, curlew sites? Thank you. What do you mean? Uh, sorry, do you mean have we seen progress in terms of increases in uh, numbers? nationally, in specifically nationally. in relation to ag uh, to afforestation, or just in general? In general, in general, maybe, okay, yeah. Yes. yeah. Um, I think it's too early to say that. I mean, there's been some. Uh, there's been um, the National Parks and Wildlife Service have implemented um, the Curlew Conservation Program, which has. Uh, um, a, a network of um, uh, staff around the country in the, in the key hotspots and Berwick Ireland has also been implementing several projects. We are working with other partners through the Curlew EIP which is a Department of Agriculture funded project and also um, I'm part of a project in the northwest of Ireland, an intra project where Curlew is also the focus of some of our work in terms of um, uh, of working at key sites. But I think, I mean, the um, T to be honest, you know the the um, you know the problems facing the curlew are so massive, you know, and so um, uh, so widespread, and you know there are you know so much needs to be needs to be done at different levels, you know that um, uh, I would say that um, it's too early for us to say really whether or not we're making sufficient progress. I think there are some small wins at some sites, and we are learning. As we do, uh, as we implement sort of conservation actions on the ground, we are learning things about how, to, how you know how to protect them. But I mean, the numbers are so small, you know, like less than 150 pairs, you know, and even the genetic diversity of that, you know, population means it's a massive challenge to to turn that around, you know. So I think there is an enormous way to go before they're going to be out of trouble, and. Um, uh, so you asked also about um, who's best placed to give the advice to, to farmers in class. I think you know ecologists. You know, I mean, and uh, now Chagas, um, they've done. Mm. We've, certainly, we have worked with with um, Chagas advisors through um, uh, through some of our um, the uh, results based programs, and uh, we're trying to implement sort of some specialised uh, or some relatively simple ways in which um, agricultural advisors can be trained up to deliver advice, but really you do need you do need ecologists, you know, and people who understand the birds. Um, obviously the farmer understands his land and he obviously, you know, is uh, very well placed to, you know, assist and deliver, you know, um, actions as well. And it's, you know, working with the farmers, you know, is very important. Um, but you know, people who understand the birds and understand their requirements are really what's needed. You know, so a network of specialised ecologists, you know, working with the Department of Agriculture, you know, working with the farmers, and we've seen it on the burn scheme, for example. You know, um, that's the kind of 
thing that needs to be replicated um, at Farnborough hotspots throughout the country. Thank you. Margaret, uh, Senator Warfield. Sure. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Um, what I think of it, the Department of Culture is preparing the architecture policy uh, for the state. Um, the last one brought us up to 2018, and just in relation to your comment about birds and buildings, uh, it might be wise to tie in with, with them. It's not nearly finished, so. Um, birds are very much indicators of the health of the environment, um, and the losses obviously have ripple effects, not just here at home, but um, internationally. Uh, and human interaction is obviously the, the main contributor here uh, to the loss of bird life. Um, use of chemicals or pesticides, change in temperatures, um, and other losses in biodiversity. Um, I think the main point of despair in this Oireachtas term was probably the passing of the World or their Heritage Act, um, which you're well aware of. We worked uh, with your organisation. Um, on it, um, and I welcome your call to repeal the Heritage Bill. We haven't had that call here yet. Um, there's been a number of high profile cases during the 2009 nesting season about uh, hedgerow cutting, some of which were conducted by public bodies. Um, from, in your experience, how pre prevalent is hedge, hedgerow cutting uh, during nesting season, um, and is it going unreported? Thank you, Senator. Um, well, um, hedge cutting during the bird breeding period, which would be between March 1st and August 31st, is the number one complaint we get at Birdwatch Ireland. Um, it can be roadside hedge cutting or sometimes clearance of in-field hedgerows as well. Um, so. Yeah, it's the number one complaint and uh, people are, get very, very upset about it. It's because it's very obvious, especially if you're driving along in the countryside. Um, now, so under the, the Wildlife Act currently, um, it's, it, there are provisions to allow for hedge cutting for road safety reasons. And that always has, that's really important, obviously. We all are road users, we need to use the road safely. Um, so that's that's important to keep in mind. So sometimes, so when we're communicating with people, we always discuss this. We'll say, well, look, you know, you know, you are, are you aware that there is these provisions within the, the Wildlife Act? Um, now, um, sometimes we feel that that reason is used to cut hedgerows where there might not be an obvious road safety concern. So. It's, um, it's, it's a tricky one. Um, it is used, I think, and uh, abused possibly uh, a little bit. Um, so is, are, is hedge cutting, is it un, unreported? Well, we get a lot of reports. I wouldn't have a figure in front of me now to tell you, but mm -hmm. we've seen a huge um, increase in people's um, concerns about hedge cutting in the last um, few years. Um, and I think it ties in with the general sentiment that people are concerned about what's happening with the environment between the extreme weather events of last year um, and impacts of climate change and um, marine plastics. There's a, a big coming together, a tipping point I think has been reached where people are, they, they just want to see more nature and, and not less. Um, so I, I think it's very difficult for the National Parks and Wildlife Service to get a conviction for um, roadside, for hedge cutting that's it's done during the breeding period because you actually literally have to catch somebody in the act mm -hmm. of doing it. So, you know, you really have to commend the, the, the the cases that have been taken by the National Parks and Wildlife Service in recent months, because it is difficult work um, to, to get these across the line. So those are, those are really positive. But it's the number one complaint you receive? It is the number one complaint, yeah. Um, secondly, I uh, enjoyed reading about the conservation success of the Rosia Turn uh, on Rockaville Island. Um, I know it's only one of many really important interventions and conservation uh, programmes um, and you mentioned the white tailed eagle as well. Um, the reintroduction of the golden eagles in Glenville Park has been really important. I know that was difficult. Um, but in terms of conservation and managed reintroduction of bird species, is there enough of a focus on that from the department? Um, I wonder, yeah. yeah. Go 
Um, yeah, so obviously it is nice to see those positive conservation stories, uh, but I think Birdwatch Ireland's uh, stance would be, um, in relation to seeing more of that, we're mentioning these colossal declines in our species that are already here that we haven't yet lost but are on the brink of extinction. The corn crakes, the curlews, the corn bunting, for example, has gone extinct back in the 90s. It's not that long ago. So I think what we'd really like to see would be uh, investments pumped in to try and save the species before we actually lose them. Because you can spend a lot of money trying to reintroduce them once they're gone. And obviously that has its place. But at the moment, I think there are so many species that are in such, uh, yeah. such trouble. Right. And we really need to pump the investment into trying to save those. Um. Just want to ask, just lastly, about the birds directive um, and how effective you think it's been in terms of protecting those birds. Um, I know we derogate from some aspects of the, uh, the directive. But do you think um, we're compliant, and could we be doing could we be doing more? Yeah, I think um, if I can maybe just say something on that um, to start with. Uh, Certainly the Birds Directive has been very important in protecting those Alex 1 species and creating these special protection areas and um, you know, the Alex 1 species are you know, those species recognised at a European level that are particularly important and I think um, the designation of the SPA network, the Nature 2000 network and the SACs as well has been extremely important in Ireland and really has protected some of our key um, hotspots. So I think. Um, the birth tract has been an incredibly important thing in that respect. Um, I would say that the one thing that um, uh, I think there is an issue with is that um, species of national importance are not addressed um, through the birth directive, and that has been a massive gap. So species such as lapwing, curlew, um, redshank um, and other species that are on the red list of birds of conservation concern in Ireland, they've been identified by the government as, priori as um, uh, priorities in the prioritised action framework, but um, because they are not Annex 1, there are no special sites designated for them, so that's one of the reasons why these species are really um, you know, declining hugely. They're amongst the most you know, the, uh, the most rapidly declining of all of our um, breeding birds, for example. And without um, any system to designate sites for species that are nationally important, not just internationally important, then um, we're going to continue to, to face the loss of, um, of and particularly farmland species, um, you know, lapwing, curlew, redshank, as I say, the sites are not designated for these species even though they're, you know, the government recognises they're very high priority. So I think that has been a failing of the birds directive, you know. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything. Um, just in relation to the derogation process, um, the, it's part of the birds directive, but it needs to be better implemented in Ireland. We need to have it done by the letter of the law. And that is, we're, we're falling short in that regard right now. So, but it is part of the birds directive and we support that, all parts of the directive. Thanks very much, it's very helpful. Eamon, do you want to? Very much indeed. I'm, I'm not a member of the committee, but when I saw your presentation, I, I wanted to come down because I think it's a hugely important um, review of where we are in this country. And as uh, Senator Marlies Adon said, uh, as a, the, the canary in the mine, is it, about our wider environmental challenges, our, the status of our bird populations is, is screaming. We have a huge problem in our sea areas, in our forests, in our wetlands, in our urban areas, in our farming. It's, it's a bleak picture and a very important picture that's told here today. So I'd like to thank you for coming in and, and, and doing it. Um, can I ask in terms of how we turn this round, and I agree with, I was watching on the monitor and, and listening uh, or into earlier questions, the response to climate change uh, can also be responded, has to be coordinated with the response to biodiversity crisis. And so the restoration of wetlands would actually be, in, in our climate committee, that's one of the issues that we, we highlight as one of the ways in which we could store carbon. Um, the reduction in the use of pesticides, the return of insect populations, which is one of the hazards you mentioned here, and the increase in soil fertility that would comfort would also improve 
the carbon storage capabilities of that farmland. Uh, and indeed, what we've also recognised is the need for greater diversity in farming is also another measure that the Climate Committee has recommended because over-reliance on monocultural uh, beef and dairy production at scale uh, is a high-risk farming strategy at this stage. So they're just two examples of where, or indeed, you could, I believe the use of marine protected areas could also have benefits in restoring more natural ecosystems to our sea areas that not only would be good for bird life, but again good for uh, the capability of those seas to store carbon and manage uh, a fast changing environment. Um, so it's interesting in regard to the uh, All of Government Climate Action Plan, which was published last week, wasn't it? I think was action 110 of that is saying we need to do a mapping exercise of our land in terms of its uh, response to climate, but also, in my mind, response to biodiversity. Has Birdwatch Ireland, uh, it was interesting you mentioned there one, the issue of the example of Chagas having a map of, um, you said areas maybe that would be suitable for curlews, was it, or? or, or you, high nature value farmland. High nature value farmland. They've, they've mapped that. Are you aware of any other mapping of where we should be planting continuous cover forestry, where we should be restoring wetlands, where we should be letting some heathlands um, still be grazed to, to protect uh, certain heathlands areas. Is there any other mapping other than that Chagas map you mentioned, of high nature value farming? Is there any other mapping work that has been done, or, or is that a project that we have to undertake in the state, both for climate reasons and biodiversity reasons? Um, yeah, there is, well, there's been, okay, so we have our Natura 2000 network, which is mapped. We would have natural heritage areas, which are also mapped, but suffering from a lack of sufficient protection, in my view. Um, and we would have wetlands mapped by some counties. Some local authorities would have undertaken wetland mapping. There's also been some... Um, ecosystem services mapping done by the National Parks and Wildlife Service and I know that a national habitat map was on the cards for a while but I'm not sure where that stands right now um, but that would be an important feature um, so potentially you could overlay a, a, that information and um, see what the gaps are then um, in terms of what else do we need to do here um, but I'm not, I'm not totally involved in that area. We have done the bird sensitivity mapping project, um, which uh, um, was um, funded by the wind energy, or partially funded by the wind energy sector itself, to identify um, areas of importance for birds that um, it wasn't creating a no-go area for, for, for wind development or whatever, but it was just highlighting those areas where particular concentrations of important birds sensitive to wind farm development occur. So that is one mapping project that we have um, instigated and we've called for a forestry sensitivity mapping mm -hmm. project and we've done some work towards that but um, that's a piece of work that really does need to be completed you know and I think it's a very important point that um, yes we do need much more um, of this kind of spatial uh, mapped information as a guide to developers you know to um, uh, uh, to county councils and local authorities, um, it's it, you know it's a very important tool. You know these kinds of mapping projects. So we haven't done enough of them. I don't think. No, I think you're right. I think part of that, and this is all has to be done. The action 110 requires calls for this mapping exercise to be done by the end of the year, mm -hmm. and I think that could be done in conjunction with the revision of the common agricultural policy provisions, so that those far when we are designating wetland areas for restoration, farmers are paid for that. When 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 we're when, we're, when we, we, we would change at the same time our entire forestry support model, so we stop supporting clear fell, single species, monoculture forestry, and start putting everything into the more diverse forestry, species, forestry environment that you've mentioned. That also requires, it seems to me, the National Parks and Wildlife Service to be really resourced properly because it's a huge project and my experience is that their numbers are very limited. I don't know if you could comment on that. Have you any sense of, uh, of the, the scale of resources you think might be needed in the National Parks and Wildlife Service? How do you find, do you find that they're able to respond quickly or are they constrained by lack of resources at the present time? 
we did have a um, discussion earlier with something that Marie, um, Marie Louise Rodon, sorry, touched on the need for a, a separate department, a natural, a natural, um, uh, a department of the of natural environment, environment. and uh, I, I think that would definitely be very helpful in increasing the the, the, the status of um, the National Parks and Wildlife Service. They're very small, very small resort and. Um, Poorly resourced organisation, and they, the, you know, they're obviously they're working very hard, and they're under enormous pressure. But um, you know, I think we would definitely um, say that they, you know, their budget needs to be hugely expanded to allow them to meet the challenges that you know we've set out in this document. Last question, if I can, Chair. Um, in urban areas, I represent an urban constituency, and we're doing our bit in terms of putting in swift boxes and so on. But is there any other advice? I mean, it seems to me our urban environment is often very diverse, rich in flora, um, all the gardens we have. Um, is there anything that you'd recommend to a householder in an urban area? What can we do? It's actually, strangely, the urban bird population is probably the least threatened because it's probably the most stable and diverse environment. Or is there more we could do in urban context to restore bird populations? Yeah, sure. So, um, I suppose there's a number of things we can do. The, I suppose, yeah, you can say urban birds are faring relatively well, but then in saying that, some of the you know species that have been affected by the, the larger scale things, such as climate change, whether they're in urban areas or rural areas, they, they appear to those populations appear to be impacted on. But we can all play our part, as you say, pushing up uh, nest boxes, particularly for species that. Um, most need them, the likes of swifts that are on the amber list, the likes of uh, spotted flycatchers and other species that are actually in decline. So uh, tailoring specific bird boxes for species that actually need help. Uh, there's a huge body of growing research that sh shows that um, feeding birds in our garden is, uh, you know, providing a uh, really important resource to help, uh, you know, increase overwintering rates for survival of birds and helping to, you know, sustain bird populations. You know, pollinators are a hot topic at the minute, and within our gardens, we can all be doing a bit to, you know, plant more uh, pollinator-friendly plants, and that uh, from the ground up has a huge impact because. You know, one of the things that we're seeing with regards to uh, our, our bird populations is um, some species in particular, uh, particularly those that uh, come from south of the Sahara to migrate here, the likes of swallows, swifts, cuckoos, martens, uh, warblers. Uh, there's a tremendous shift to the northwest in those populations, which we think is driv driven very much by, by climate change. But at a lower level, there are insect populations and the huge declines in insect populations may well be one of the factors there. So these are big challenges. We can all certainly, you know, chip in and, and do our bit at, at, at community level and, and, you know, in our, in our homes and gardens. Um, okay. Deputy, would it be okay if I just uh, added something to that, Kim okay. Carla? Okay. Just in relation to um, what we can do. Um, it's important as well to um, consider that, uh, like in Ireland anyway, there's our, most of our biggest cities are in coastal areas and there's significant populations um, of people close to areas where there are significant populations of, of water birds. So for instance in Dublin Bay you have a lot of mud flats and uh, a lot of wintering water birds that travel a long way to spend the winter in Ireland. Um, it's, it's really important to consider the impacts of disturbance on water bird species. Um, we're concerned about the cumulative impacts of development um, dis disturbance um, and other impacts on these species. So, for instance, like um, putting your dog on a leash when there's a when there's a flock of terns nesting on Sandy Mount, roosting on Sandy Mount Strand, for instance, in August, um, remembering that these birds travel a long distance, they're trying to save their energy to return to their breeding grounds to be able to be in good breeding condition. Um, and when they are spending energy to flee from a dog or a person or activity that's disturbing them, then um, that impacts pop, uh, can have impacts at, at a wider scale. So. It's important for people to enjoy nature and to observe and to kind of look at, you know, how, how your interactions are with, with wild birds, but to maybe also keep your distance as well. Um, it would be good. Dr. Clark, Deputy Smith. 
Thank you very much, folks. Um, in terms of the biodiversity and protecting uh, nature, our local authorities, I suppose my view of it would be they play a role and could play a, a very major role. At the moment, I would see it as perhaps the most obvious role is where our heritage officers do run biodiversity schemes and programmes and you know, provide education in schools and sort of hands-on practical experience for the next generation coming along. But in terms of our local authorities, do you feel more could be done? Do you feel there is enough being done? Is there, apart from the heritage officers, I mean, obviously our planning departments are meant to be aware of protecting our environment and what's appropriate for the landscape. Um, but I would just like your views and thoughts of you know, the local authorities' role in all of this in terms of protecting our environment and biodiversity. I might just start off on that point, just in relation to the, the Heritage Officer Network. Like we would work very closely with them to do tremendous work, but I suppose I'd find that um, the resource that they have and the budgets that they have within their counties is, is tiny every year, which really ham hamstrings them in relation to what they can actually really achieve. So that's certainly one of the first things I'd be saying is, you know, they, they do great work given the resource and the capacity that, that they have, but that really is so limited. And then in relation to biodiversity officers, like we only have, I think, a small number of counties across the country that actually have biodiversity officers, something that certainly could, you know, consider rolling that out. Um, I'd just like to add that um, yeah, you're absolutely right. The, the local authorities play a hugely important part in, um, in protecting our biodiversity. And I know a lot of them have taken up the, the pollinator plan, for instance, and have started to initiate that in their local areas, which is great, because that'll help with birds as well. If places are allowed to let the grass grow a little bit longer, that, that's good for insects and good for bird populations. Um, one thing we would say I think would be great to see happen is if each local authority had an ecologist in, sitting in the local authority um, that could review planning applications. Certainly, we find that um, the, that that is a, a sometimes is a gap that could be that could be filled in terms of the ecological expertise for reviewing planning applications and giving that local advice. Okay. Okay. I've, I've a number of questions I just myself. To ask something. Just a very simple thing. Yeah. I just wanted to ask um, Deputy Eamon Ryan, who is here today, what he thought of my idea of a of a Department of Natural Environment, or does he think that we're on? Because I know he leads. He leads the green agenda here, not agenda is the wrong word. He, he, he um, can answer, answer that one outside. <laughs> no, but I just wanted to know what he thought about it, because right, I think I, this is that's a very realistic no, not, prospect, I'm, you know, if we're, if we're serious. Senator, I, I agree with you, but at the moment, the question, question borders watch Ireland. I have a number of questions. Um, well, yeah, or, I mean, he's not allowed to answer that. Well, we can, he can, if we have time, we have to be out of here quality. Fault. Yes. Okay. Oh, sorry, Chair. Not, but I, I just yeah. I meant get... I, I, I meant it in relation to the conversation no, we're having. I, I didn't understand mean it that I'm not trying to cut it down. I won't get an answer anyway. We, 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 we get that answer in a few minutes. Just uh, I, I want to thank you for the the. Chuck him Ash good. Liam McCreek now just make him a catch in the hand. Oh, sorry, sorry. Or do sport. No, no. Just the 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 figures that you gave us is very stark. Cruel. Kind of, but there was uplifting tales of success that you. One of the questions I had is. Can lost species be reintroduced? So we've seen obviously eagles, but kind of you, you, you mentioned the corn buntings and, uh, and the likes. Or is it that we we don't have enough resources uh, kind of to do both work? One to concentrate on those that are at risk, kind of, which is the red list that you, you mentioned. And I don't know how many birds are on that list. Um, and kind of the other is kind of do we have the wherewithal at this stage to reintroduce those that we've lost? In terms of the, the swift bricks, kind of, I, I agree with you in terms of the need for that to be in all public buildings, but also all buildings of a certain site, size in, in this city. Um, the, the, I was talking to uh, a board watcher yesterday, I think it was, uh, and he was concerned about uh, the, how low the insect level is this year so far. Um, he, he, he was noticing that it was lower this year than, than before, so I don't know whether you've uh, got that uh, elsewhere. And kind of a question I was asked, and, and I, I know it's come up kind of uh, amongst other people, um, is 
around the seagull, and kind of some people regard the seagulls as pests. There's different seagulls. I don't know what are most. So, kind of, can you kind of dispel the myth or confirm the myths around seagulls? Kind of whether they're uh, a, a danger to other smaller species, or kind of what's what's the impacts, um, and kind of uh, what what can we do to protect those uh, seabirds that are, are, are at risk? And the final, final question for now is, there was a, a, a mention a few times of, uh, of funding and kind of uh, ha, ha, how much kind of we need additional funding. Um, kind of usually the, the job in here is for us to put forward ideas, but we also need to have some ideas of how much uh, Different projects cost. So, for instance, you, you, you mentioned the increased funding in Irish Parks and Wildlife, and I, we, we can imagine that. But if there's a specific program of public education, is there a specific uh, pro, uh, cost involved in reintroducing or protecting uh, diff different species of birds um, in, in their habitats? Oh, I'm sorry, the, the, the last one I had. I had. Um, have you been involved with Bordemont and their plans as they withdraw from uh, peat extraction and, and supposedly uh, reinstatement bogs that kind of they have uh, eradicated? Kind of ha have views uh, in, involved yourselves with them to try and appeal to them uh, around the reintroduction of different habitats that have. Uh, disappeared in the countryside. Can I allow them? Um, so maybe just to start at the top with the reintroductions. Yeah. Um, certainly it's possible, as you've seen with some of the birds of prey and our uh, partners in the UK, the RSPB, have reintroduced other species as well. So it certainly is possible. But I think what we know of these reintroductions is they're hugely expensive. Um, and at the minute, we don't have the money to adequately protect these species that are suffering 40, 60, 80 percent declines. So, although it is possible as a very last uh, measure, um, I think we'd be very supportive of seeing uh, all efforts made to protect the species that we have in the first instance. Um, just in relation to the insect declines, uh, recent research coming out of Germany about a year ago showed that. Um, of nature reserves that have been monitored there over a period of about, I think it was 20 years, the insect populations declined by 70 per cent. And the most recent data coming out of Ireland, uh, led by the National Biodiversity Data Centre on various ins insects, is showing qu quite significant population decline. So we're seeing the same in Ireland and throughout the food chain that's going to have a really you know, serious impact. Um, just in relation to goals, um, certainly it is uh, uh, certainly in, in some parts of the city and other parts of the country, uh, this movement of goals into urban areas that are now nesting uh, is happening, and in some, some cases it's certainly an issue. But I think one of the key points here that we need to remember is the herring gull, for example, which is one of the species that we're talking about, is on the red list. So it's on the same list of species as the curlew and the corncrake. Um, their natural sites, if you like, along the coastal areas have been decimated in the past 20 or 30 years. So uh, what we need to do in the first instance is to find out how these populations are changing, what the numbers are like, uh, so to do some proper scientific uh, surveys and monitoring uh, of these uh, gull um, nest sites in our urban areas before we start talking about what comes next or management. Sorry, possibly just add to um, the topic on reintroduction. Um, I think one of the problems with reintroductions is that um, the landscape needs to be there to support um, a recovering population, and very often that is the major challenge for us, that the habitat loss has been so severe um, to have caused the populations <clears throat> to become extinct in the first place that it would be madness really to reintroduce those populations back to attempt reintroductions to um, landscapes that are very poor and are not able to support them. So the restoration of the landscape is the number one thing that needs to be done before we look at bringing those birds back. Um, so just you also mentioned um, Board Nimona, and uh, yes, we've had quite a close working relationship with Board Nimona in particular over the curly, their curly populations. They probably support um, 
uh, just under about one fifth of the national um, curlew population on their land holdings, and um, they've been quite supportive of. Um, uh, you know, they've um, uh, they've been attempting to protect the species where they do have them on their land holdings. So, certainly, I think Bordenmore should be commended in that respect. They've taken some action on, on curlew, um, definitely, um, and uh, we are working on several projects. Um, uh, in the northwest, in relation to um, peat restor uh, restoration of peatlands, we've got a couple of big sites in the northwest that we're working with National Parks and Wildlife on on drain blocking projects, and uh, on blanket bog. Which I mean, there's been quite a lot of work done on the raised bogs, obviously, but we're trying to look now um, at the blanket bogs and restoration programmes for those. And I think, uh, if I can <laughs> finally, I think one of your other questions was in relation to. Funding and is there, um, you know, what is really needed, yeah. you know, um, to, and I mean, I think we probably would all say that, um, yes, proper resourcing of uh, National Parks and Wildlife Service is extremely important, um, and funding of education programmes, again, a massively important area. We know that that's really. Um, one of the ways in which people learn to appreciate, you know, their environment uh, more, um, and um, I think um, um, uh, I think within the Department of Agriculture, for example, um, you know, more ecologists and more, um, uh, you know, would be something that would be very important uh, to try and do to make our, our um, agriculture schemes more wildlife friendly. That's got to be one of the most important things we need to deliver on for farmland birds. Um, Carol Corley, just to add there on the, the funding, um, it's very hard to give a figure um, here um, to answer your question on how much is needed. Um, but I would say that I know that there was a report done by National Parks and Wildlife Service on finance, financial requirements um, and the different potential funding opportunities that exist. So we might come back to you with, the, with that report, yeah, for instance. But um, we'd also say for um, non-governmental organisations such as ourselves, um, <laughs> additional funding through the and um, which through the Department of Communication, Climate Action and the Environment, which provides some little bit of core funding for um, non-governmental organisations to be able to do work. Um, like that is that is also very important, um, core funding to help organisations like ourselves do the work. I mean, we'd also like to see like a, a separate fund so that um, and NGOs can access match funding for the likes of leader projects and all these big projects that are out there. Often we're constrained with not being able to um, uh, to tap into large scale funds because we don't have the matching funding. So these kinds of funding constraints, they, they, sh they, they shouldn't be too difficult to work out, but they, they have to be worked out. Okay. Take that on board. Uh, and talk to Quave. Now we have 15 minutes before I to evacuate. No, no, I need a question. It doesn't get in the cash. Uh, thank you very much. Um, just a few points or questions. Um, looking around the country, I suppose the biggest change is that. The uniformity of the change in different areas, but there's different change in different areas. So in the very intensive farming, you're getting very aggressive farming methods, high use of the land, and a huge level of monocultural production of whatever, but in most cases it's grass and animals that graze grass. You'd obviously have the tillage areas as well, but then they're in big swarms of tillage. Now, when I look at the west of Ireland, what's quite significant is that it's not a question of intensification of farming, it's the opposite seems to be the biggest change. So when I drive around and look, what are the big changes I see? Uh, change number one is that a lot of land hasn't been farmed at all, so it's actually gone wild with bushes and scrub and whatever. Um, the second thing is that farming is totally monocultural. Where any farming is taking place, it's purely grass, purely grass. So there's, today, even 30 years ago, lots of people are sowing a few acres of uh, oats or 
some kind of crop. They were obviously growing vegetables and potatoes and whatever, so they were tilling soil. Um, and I'm wondering how much has have the change in farming practice, which are not all towards intensification, changed bird populations of different types and affected some more than others. Uh, and the second question that leads to, and I noticed there's a reference here to, uh, to, to the glass scheme. If we were to try to recreate a more mixed approach to farming, particularly in areas where it's literally just gone into one uh, on a cultural, in other words, a bit of tillage and whatever, by fairly significant grants under a, an environmental scheme, would that help to create the diversity of the past? Because whatever was happening was creating, if I understand what you're saying, a lot more diversity than we have now. Uh, and if a lot of us down to farming habits, we have to look how that changed. But it didn't, as I said, all change towards intensification. Some of us changed exactly in the opposite direction towards detensification and monoculturalism. So you've gone from very intensive farming with every green bit of land being used, but being used in a, in a multi-purpose fashion, down to half the land being going wild and the other half uh, just grass. Uh, and I just say, I'm wondering whether there was, as part of a scheme, something that encouraged a little bit of village <coughs> or growing things such as vegetables and potatoes and so on. Um, would, would you believe that that would have a change? Uh, in other words, that would create something akin to what we had in farming practice if we went 50, 60, 70 years ago. Um, Obviously, in the very, very intensive areas, I take it that some birds are very vulnerable because with mechanisation, whatever, you're going right into the hedge in a way you couldn't do before intense mechanisation came in. And have your suggestions how that issue would be dealt with and how farmers would be incentivised to... There were these, it meant to be these nature areas, I understand, with tillage, but I wonder how that actually worked. Um, now, two other questions. You, you mentioned the curlew. I think I mentioned this to you before. Um, where I live, there would, be, would have been curlews nesting on the islands and the lakes. And I'm told that one of the problems we face is mink. Yes. Uh, mink. Mink. Because mink can swim. Foxes can't. You never find a fox on an island. Um, and I'm wondering how much, again, have species that have been introduced into the wild affected native populations uh, of birds that particularly nest in the grass and are vulnerable to uh, animals such as mink uh, and animals of prey that can go to places that other animals can't go. Uh, on the other hand, from what I hear in Ireland, such as Boffin and Eastwark and so on, and what I hear in Redden and the Gaeltuk, that there seems to be a bit of a comeback from the corn creek. Now, I know that there have been good programmes uh, in relation to that that have certainly assisted. I'm wondering what numbers are we at with the corn creek? Have we analysed what's been the cause, which one of the actions taken is, you know, what are the actions that have been taken that have had actually a positive effect? Um, I was told correctly or maybe incorrectly that one of the reasons for the demise of the corn creek in places where there's not a problem of over-mechanical harvesting in the places the corn creek would have been uh, wasn't just simply uh, mechanical harvesting because that wasn't the problem on uninhabited islands, but it was actually the lack of farming and the lack of any activity there. Again, back to what I was saying in the first point, that the humans actually had created circumstances for some of these birds that were very friendly to them, right? and the interaction between humans acting in certain traditional ways and the birds had created what we had in the 19th and early 20th century. And how much uh, do we have to positively create that and just letting the place go wild isn't the, the simple answer to getting some of these birds back. Um, I think, uh, so if I can <laughs> go back to the beginning there. Um, 
Uh, Jeff, you were saying, uh, so a couple of points you were making about, um, at the start there about um, the changes in the West, particularly in and the North West as well, um, where you've got these marginal areas which have effectively been abandoned and, you know, farming, farm, you know, farming doesn't happen there anymore, you know, I mean, um, and... Or oh, whatever farming happens, it's just pure cattle and sheep. Yes. But the yes. other elements of farming that would have been quite have, have been, have strong been. in every farm would have done yeah. a bit of... Yeah. Yes, I mean, I think that's, that's definitely one of the things we refer to in our document, that um, in the longer document is the loss of mixed farming and um, the fact that, um, you know, farms in the past would all have been, you know, much lower intensity, they'd be much more diverse, they would have, everybody would have a little patch of oats and, um, you know, there'd be some grazing and there would be, you know, um, this mixture which is so rich in wildlife inputs were far lower and, um you know, management was much more sympathetic to wildlife. Hay meadows were cut late. There wasn't multiple cut silage, for example. So all of those, um, I mean, were, you know, all of those things would have been very important in, in producing an environment that was rich in wildlife. And gradually, different elements of those mixed farms have been lost. So um, the loss of um, our small patches of arable has been very significant um, for species such as yellowhammer um, and skylark and the corn bunting. One of the reasons why we've lost the corn bunting has been because of that loss of mixed farming. Um, and that's also why you only see, I mean, the vast majority of yellow hammers now in, are, are in the west of the, are in the, the east where the larger, um, more intensive arable farms are found, you know. So that's, it's definitely been very significant. But in terms of the um, abandonment of, of farming, I mean, obviously that is a reflection of the lack of support for low intensity, um, uh, you know, beef and uh, uh, sheep farming. You know, the money is to be made in dairy, is, you know, as you know, like, and, and there isn't enough support for. Um, for, for you know, for low intensity um, beef farming, for example, and that's the kind of farming that supports curlew, you know, and supports um, you know some of the other farmland birds. Like so, I think if we are really serious about retaining these farmland birds, then we need to be giving more support to these farmers who have you know these much lower intensity um, farmland systems, which are more friendly to wildlife. I think there's no there's there's no doubt about that. And we did touch on it earlier on. Um, my colleagues might want to add something, but I'll just uh, on that particular issue. But in relation to mink, yes, absolutely, we are um, very sure that mink are having a serious impact on a wide range of ground nesting birds, and it's not just mink. Mink, yes, they're reintroduced. They're a, a non-native species, but some of our uh, native mammalian species are equally devastating. So foxes, even otters, pine martens, all of these species are having a severe impact on. Um, ground nesting birds such as the curlew lapwing, these um, ones that are declining so rapidly that we're so concerned about. Um, uh, so um, I think there's, and we are we are having to address um, issues such as this by tackling, you know, um, this predation by controlling some of these species ourselves. Not some of our members don't like it, but I mean, in a way, we say, well, you know, it, it, you know, we have got to protect, take measures to protect these species which are on the verge of extinction. You know, so, um, and what we're developing in one of our um, EIPs, one of our. Um, uh, the European Innovation Programmes that we're running with the Department of Agriculture in uh, in Galway, um, in in the South Loch Corrib area, we're look um, we're looking at working with farmers to um, to train them up in some of these techniques to control these predators um, where there are these vulnerable populations of, of, of ground nesting birds. Not everywhere. It's only just in a few key hotspots that this needs to be done. So we're we're not shirking away from from that issue. Um, you yeah, asked about Corn Creek as well, and um, in terms of the numbers of Corn Creeks, we're currently at about 150 or so pairs. And if you look back over the last 20 years, since uh, Corn Creek Conservation Programme was initiated by um, by Borough Child and RSPB initially, and then the National Parks and Wildlife Service um, took it over, you know the population has fluctuated up and down, but it hasn't really changed all that much. Like, so ha there hasn't been um, a real wide-scale recovery of Corn Creek populations, and they are becoming more and more marginalised to the islands that you've mentioned. Um, you know we are finding that the, the the numbers in the mainland are going to continuing to go down. So yes, you, they are still finding some of these. Um, uh, um, islands where um, there is still some very low intensity farming happening, but yes, they are also found on on islands where where the farming is, you know, ha has more or less disappeared. Um, but I think for us to 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 um, uh, there are some, I and mean, we really do know what needs to be done to 
to it's not you know it's not a particularly complex problem we know what needs to be done to allow concrete populations to recover and increase um, and I think there's just not enough resources being put in to uh, to um, to do it. So that's the the bottom line, really. So I don't know if my colleagues want to add anything on any of those points that you've raised um, in relation to. Well, I just wanted to add, um, Deputy, on your your question about intensive farms, and you know that you know they also need to do their bit. Um, I just wanted to let you know about a, a project in Cork. Um, it's the Bride Farming for Nature project where um, Donald Sheehan and others in the Bride Valley um, on intensive um, dairy and beef and other farms are um, trying to set aside maybe up to 10% of their farm of their intensive land in order to help biodiversity. So it's a European innovation project as well. Um, and they're they're doing they're doing really good work, and the farmers there are lining up to get involved because they want to do a bit more, and that's that's really inspirational. So if you're ever down down that way, I would highly advise maybe um, stopping in because it is it is really great to see. Um, so I just wanted to add that. But can I just one quick, say one the very quick thing? No matter what, yeah. So. Um, we're now heading towards 2020, so we start all over again with all these new schemes. Now, first of all, under WTO rules, you, you can't pay farmers for production. Maybe right, maybe wrong, but it's the way it is. Now, what I would think would be very desirable if there was much more cooperation between farming organisations and the likes of yourselves to come up with environmental schemes would actually do more for the environment than the present schemes, but it would also reward the farmers because you can't live on scenery. Reward the farmers and make it profitable for them to stay in business and to farm to a type of farming that maximises uh, uh, you know, the protection of nature, which is not a non-farming, which is where we're headed. It's a farming that, as I said, is incompatible with very, very good nature product uh, thing. It seems to me that class and D schemes, AOS, and, uh, are way too confined when it comes to actually dealing with environmental issues, and they don't really reward for positive action. And to put it at its simplest, the easiest way to get the money into those schemes is actually to do very little. That you're not going to be penalised or you're a lot less vulnerable to penalties. I think we need to have this debate now rather than when the schemes are on top of us. Careful. I would just I would agree entirely. Um, Deputy Anna, I say we do work very closely with the Irish Nature and Hill Farmers Association, for example, we're partners with them in several projects. But um, and you know, we would be completely of your opinion that you know this low intensity farming systems, you know, need to be protected. But it is not current government policy. And you know, current government policy is all towards intensification, expansion of the dairy industry. You know, um, so I think you know we are doing our best to um, to you know to get our voice heard. But at the moment, unfortunately, I think government policy is not with us. Sorry, I let you out of time because there's no, another. No, I just wanted to ask that question. You see, you promised me I, that that, that you, we I could be answered. I thought you could ask them afterwards. The question was, do we think that, uh, what would we hear from you, that we should have, really, a Department of Natural Environment? He doesn't have time to answer it now. Um, well, I, so I, 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 well um, Birdwatch I, Ireland seems to think so, and what, I'm just interested in what... In, I, I, I know you are, you've said that, but I want to bring the meeting to a uh, close. Our news fire while I'm of the wall, Lydia, Brian, Una, Anita. Um, we heard a very stark message today about... Uh, kind of what, what, what is happening with human activity endangering not only the boards this week and two weeks ago we had the, the, the bees, but also human population by virtue of endangering our own ecosystems. Um, and what I heard from today is a call of action on us, also for yourselves, and hopefully people outside are listening in and will read kind of the, the stark facts and figures that you gave. Um, and hopefully, kind of when you're back here again, that kind of we will have 
good news kind of coming from your end, but also maybe hopefully the Minister uh, will look at the funding proposals kind of that come to him in relation to work that needs to be done. So, Kulamahagravarish, Kurnshishin, Skor, Len, Brahnu, Erin Avershahanu, Agazarish, Walam of Wake as a Gual, then a Hunna de Erfado, Boardwatch Ireland, as a Kum of Hogshit and Kushtin Yov, Kulamagar, as Fassel, Erin Krinu and Yu, Agas, on Krinu, Er Ahlo, Shinadia. Shinai?